Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to look at BBC Culture's top 12 books of 2023 so far. At the middle of the year, I love these lists because it's sort of like a check-in on where we are and how the year has been going. And I just love that. I've already done a video about Time Magazine's best books of 2023 so far. I'll link it down below if you haven't seen it or you're interested. I wanted to do another one because I do find these lists interesting. And again, I really love that sort of check-in. And I love finding books that passed me by. And since this is a BBC list and I live in the United States, some of these books maybe haven't been published or marketed in the United States. So it's fun to discover new things. I love lists as a tool of discovery. If you follow along, you are aware of that. So I am looking forward to jumping through this. It seems like a really interesting list, so I'm happy to cover it. I will be doing my own best of 2023 so far, probably in early July. I want to wait until June is over so you get that full six months. Uh, it only seems fair to me, and hopefully Joel will be joining me. Joel is my husband, and uh, we will be doing that. So let's jump into this list. Again, there are 12 titles. The first one is not all that much of a surprise. It's Victory City by Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie is a literary giant. To me, he kind of harkens back to a day when literary giants were sort of viewed as cultural critics. Uh, in the old days, they would be invited onto like talk shows and they would talk and occasionally they would feud and disagree with each other. He seems to be very much in that mold of literary celebrity. Uh, obviously, authors don't get invited on talk shows all that much anymore these days. Uh, th those days are gone, but uh, he still feels like that type of literary celebrity. He's sort of an old-fashioned literary celebrity living in the current media climate, which makes him interesting. And uh, to say that he's been having a difficult time recently would be a massive understatement. I believe this was the first book that he has published since he was stabbed and uh, has, has been recovering from those injuries. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrible situation. I'm sure you are all uh, familiar with it, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. Now, let's look at this book because I, I knew he had published a book. I admit I didn't really pay too close attention to it. The only book of his that I've read is Midnight's Children, which I did read in high school, and I remember loving it. I don't remember all that much about the book, so it's something that I would probably need to revisit at some point. I have a copy of The Satanic Verses, which is his m most famous and most controversial novel. It is the one that caused a lot of problems for him over the years, and uh, I, I want to get to it at some point, but I have not. And I've heard sort of mixed things about some of his other books, but by and large, he seems to be a very consistently loved author and certainly someone worth supporting. Here's what they say about Victory City. The 15th novel from the Booker Prize winning author of Midnight's Children, The Satanic Verses, and Quichotte, Victory City, described by The New Yorker as immensely enjoyable, is an era-spanning epic that begins in 14th century southern India. Its heroine is a grief-stricken nine-year-old girl, Pampa Kampana, who is instructed by a goddess to create equality for women in a patriarchal world. Kampana's fortune over centuries becomes interwoven with that of the great empire of Bisnaga, the victory city of the title. In this novel, Rushdie has created an alternative Mahabharata, writes The Guardian, an elaborate founding myth from the bare bones of history. And that definitely sounds like something that is in Salman Rushdie's wheelhouse. Uh, Midnight's Children is a very magical realist book, and I know he has really flirted with mythology in a lot of his other books. It's sort of his signature style. Uh, I believe in uh, even Quichotte takes Don Quixote, Quixote, Quichotte, and sort of spins it into another sort of almost mythical story. So uh, this definitely sounds like something in his wheelhouse. I think if I'm going to read a Salman Rushdie book and I would like to revisit, I'm probably actually going to reread Midnight's Children or I would just get around to reading the Satanic Verses, which I have been meaning to do for a really long time. This does sound interesting. And Salman Rushdie is, is interesting because he can be a very prickly person as well. That, that's sort of the danger and the one of the reasons he really reminds me of those old literary celebrities. Uh, because a lot of the time when they would get on talk shows and uh, act as cultural critics and maybe even feud with each other, they didn't always come across the best. And sometimes he doesn't. But, you know, again, uh, what happened to him is terrible. Uh, he is an author worth supporting and whose voice has clearly res resonated with a lot of people. And he is an author that I would would like to explore more uh, at some point. But again, if I am going to be jumping into one of his books, I'm probably going to reread Midnight's Children or I'm going to get to 
the satanic verses. This does sound interesting, especially since it does have that lens of a sort of feminist message uh, woven into the history of India. If you've read it, I'd be really curious to have uh, your feedback in the comments down below, so please let me know. The next one is Burnham Wood by Eleanor Catton. Before I describe who Eleanor Catton is, I'm going to read the blurb because I feel like they're probably going to tell you. Eleanor Catton won the Booker Prize in 2013 for her novel, The Luminaries. Yeah, they sure did. And the New Zealand author's latest offering, witty thriller Burnham Wood, has also been highly acclaimed. Eco-activism meets staggering affluence when the young members of an environmental rights group end up being entangled with a billionaire drone manufacturer. Catton is not just a master at spinning a web of competing philosophies, says Vogue.com. Her characters are deeply flawed, but you can't help but root for them. The Guardian praises Catton as a novelist of lavish technical gifts who addresses herself to the world broadly and richly conceived. Burnham Wood is, says the reviewer, another virtuoso performance, elaborately plotted, richly conceived, enormously readable. I have not read The Luminaries. It's a big, big, big book. And uh, the feedback I've gotten on it has been very mixed. Some people just love it. Clearly, the Booker Prize jury for that year loved it as well. I've also had some people say that it's a little bit boring and overly dense, and that has really made me stay away. It seems like Burnham Wood is a much more accessible book, but I'm not sure it's a book that really grabs my attention. Eleanor Catton was interviewed on the New York Times Book Reviews podcast not that long ago, and she had a very fascinating conversation about what inspired the book and how she structured it and why it sort of is the way it is. They even got into spoiler territory. So before you go seek out that podcast episode, know that they do include spoilers for what happens in the end. The conversation about the book made me appreciate everything that she does. It did not really spark my interest in reading the book. And that sort of stands as I'm reading this description of it. It definitely seems more accessible than The Luminaries, which again... It seems like a lot of people have said it's overly dense, really complex, and uh, again, it's a long book, so it demands a lot of your attention and uh, your mental resources. Um, I'm not opposed to reading Burnham Wood at some point, but I think there are so many other things that have come out this year that I would rather catch up to first that uh, I would probably let this one go. If it ends up on the Booker long list, or maybe even the short list, which is a distinct possibility, maybe I will end up rethinking it. If you've read it and would like to change my mind, please just show your work in the comment section down below. But I feel like I'm doing okay <laughs> skipping Burnham Wood for now, at least. The next one is Shy by Max Porter. Here's what they say. From the author of Lanny and the death of Francis Bacon, Porter's fourth book is another slight volume of experimental poetic prose. Its hero is a 15-year-old Shy, who we encounter as he walks away from Last Chance, a home for troubled youth with his pockets full of rocks. Shy is Porter's best, says The Telegraph, since his acclaimed 2015 debut, Grief is a Thing with Feathers. Quote, an act of humanity and grace heightened by its distinctive form and artistry. End quote. According to the I newspaper, it is a dazzling bolt of prose in the long night of our times. I feel like this is an author I've been hearing a lot about and at great length for a couple of years, probably since Grief is the Thing with Feathers. Uh, that book definitely got a lot of attention. Actually, Lanny is the one that I think most people talked about. It was the favorite of a lot of people on BookTube the year it was published. And I've never caught up with Max Porter. I think the thing that makes me hold off is actually the thing that they say, uh, experimental poetic prose. That is, I don't read a lot of poetry. I don't really respond to experimental books very much. Maybe I'm a little bit too literal of a person, but that has always made me hold off. However, I was really curious to read Lanny. I feel like I haven't heard a whole lot about Shy yet. I actually had forgotten that he had released a new book completely at this point. I feel like if I'm going to read a Max Porter book, I'm going back to one of the old ones. I don't think I would pick this one up. So, so sort of similar to Salman Rushdie. I don't think this is the book that I would immediately get to. I think feel like with Max Porter, I would pick up Lanny um, and do that because that is the one that I've really heard a lot about. I just really haven't heard a lot of people talking about Shy at this point. Again, maybe if he makes the Booker long list or anything like that, I'll start to change my mind. But right now, I feel like Lanny is the book that I would pick up by Max Porter if I were going to pick one up. Uh, I feel like 
right now there are so many other books that I would get to before I would read Lanny. But again, if you'd like to change my mind, let me know in the comment section down below. I feel like <laughs> I called this list really interesting and the first three books I've said, nah, I mean, they seem interesting, but I would prioritize other things first. I still think it's a really good and interesting list, and uh, there there will be others that I am definitely interested in. Uh, let's see what happens with Pineapple Street by Jenny Jackson, because I admit I've seen this book on social media a lot, but I don't actually know what the book is about. And I tried not to look at the description. Actually, I did not read any of the descriptions of the books before filming because I wanted sort of honest reactions in real time. And by the way, I should point out, I'm not attempting to review any of these books because sometimes people get a little upset saying, how can you review books that you haven't read? No, the whole point is that I haven't read these books. I am just reacting to the descriptions of them and their inclusion on this list and really trying to decide if they are books that I myself am interested in. I don't pretend to be an authority on them if I haven't read them. Uh, and talking to you, maybe if you have read them, you can ch tell me which ones I should give a try. Uh, and just maybe if you haven't heard of these books, um, it's a journey for you as well, where maybe you'll discover something that you would like to read. That's the hope. That's the intention. That's all. Quote, marvelous, clever, funny, and brilliantly well observed is how India Knight describes Pineapple Street in the Sunday Times. The debut novel by Jenny Jackson explores generational wealth and privilege in forensic detail, following three women who are part of the super wealthy Stockton clan in leafy Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights, New York. One was born into wealth, one has married into it, and one wants to give it away. What is impressive about the work is that it treats rich people as fallible human beings, says Medium. Although these characters are imperfect, you'll fall in love with them anyway, and you'll want to know how they turn out once the end of the book is reached. Okay, that does sound really interesting and like something that I might want to read. I don't know that I would run out and purchase a copy, but I would probably, I'm going to circle back to this when I'm done filming. Maybe I'll see if my library has a copy or if the audio of it is on any of my subscription apps, like Scribd, and uh, maybe take that approach because it does sound interesting. I, I don't know that I would, there are other books that I'm already thinking I want to read in July and this is not supplanting any of those. However, it is something that sounds really interesting and like I might want to catch up to it at some point this year. So I am going to seek it out either through my library or on subscription apps. And I'm not going to prioritize it at this point, but it does sound like something that would be really interesting. So there you go. We have a discovery uh, on this list so far, or one <laughs> so far, but that's something, that's something. Hopefully you've been discovering some stuff as well. Next we have Mame by Jessica George. Jessica George's debut novel became an instant New York Times bestseller when it was published earlier this year. Favorable comparisons have been made with another publishing sensation, Candace Carty Williams' Queenie from 2019. Maddie, nicknamed Mame, is a 20-something Londoner with Ghanaian parents who forgoes the regular trials of a 25-year-old existence as the primary caregiver to her father, who has Parkinson's. A coming-of-age story about family, relationships, and identity, Mame writes the Washington Post, isn't always an easy story to read, but it is always told with grace and compassion. The New York Times says, George shows the details and scope of life with such confidence and joie de vivre, it's easy to forget she's a first-time novelist. All right, this is another book I feel like I have seen the cover a lot on social media, but I didn't really know what it was about. And the way they talk about it does really spark my interest. So there you go. We, we have two at this point. Uh, I'm going to see if my library has a copy and maybe seek out an audio on one of my subscription apps uh, because that does sound really interesting. And kind of like with Pineapple Street, I don't think it's going to supplant any of the books that I'm hoping to get to in July once Pride Month is done. Because in Pride Month, I try to read... LGBTQ plus authors and stories. It's what I do in Pride Month. And I, I don't think, uh, so I kind of have a backup. I have some books that have already um, pushed to July. And I don't think either Pineapple Street or Mommy is going to you know, work its way in front of those books. If you've read them and would like to make a case, let me know in the comments down below. But um, it does sound like something that would be really interesting. I love the idea of uh, the, it being told with grace and compassion. That really sparks my interest right away. So I have not read Candace Cardi Williams' Queenie, by the way, but I, it is something that I've been sort of intending to pick up at some point. Uh, it's always the danger when you don't get to something right away that it ends up just slipping further and further down the line, and then here you are. It's been since 2019, and I haven't gotten around to it. But that definitely, Mame, does sound like a really interesting book to me, like something that could potentially really spark my interest. 
So uh, I will see if I can find a copy for at some point this year. Now we have one of the books that I have not heard of completely, so it'll be interesting to see the description and whether or not it's something that I would like to seek out. It is The Survivalists by Kashana Cauley. In The Survivalists, Aretha, a lawyer, moves in with her coffee entrepreneur boyfriend, Aaron, and his doomsday prepping housemates. What follows is a half-joking exploration of capitalism, gun ownership, and what it takes to survive in the modern world as a Black American. Learn her name because Kali is one of the funniest writers at work today, period, says the Los Angeles Times. Vulture agrees, describing Kali as one of the smartest and funniest writers working today. And this novel is a chance for fans to spend even more time with her cutting critiques of the flaws in American culture. I think I'm going to have to seek this one out as well. And it's kind of like with the last two. I don't think I'm going to bump it ahead of some of the things that I prioritize, but it does sound like something I'd like to catch up on. I don't know if it's available in the United States because I hadn't heard of this book at all. I really was hesitant at first because it talks about doomsday preppers and uh, critiquing like gun ownership. And America is in such a place right now that I am sort of instantly on guard when you have that kind of thing. Like gun ownership is such a, has become such a toxic conversation to have with the people who get really defensive about it and yet it is something that really needs attention and reform and yeah i said it it needs attention it needs reform um but politics in this country have become so toxic that i'm immediately wary when a book sort of wades into that waters uh, and this coming from the perspective of uh what it is like to be a black woman in america today and the fact that it is described as funny makes me feel like I could get around my resistance to addressing those topics because people are just not addressing those topics in the real world. And it makes me, it makes me mad. Politics right now really stresses me out, really makes me mad. This seems like a way of getting around that resistance that I have. So I'm going to seek this out. Maybe I'll look for a couple more reviews and see, uh, but I, it sounds like something that I would definitely be interested in. So you see, there you go. We're doing really well with the BBC Cultures list, after all. Uh, if you have read The Survivalist, I'd be really curious to hear what you thought of it. Uh, let me know in the comment section down below. Now we have the first book that I actually own a copy of. There are two on this list. I did go through just to see what was on it, so I could you know, pull copies of books that I own. So we have Wandering Souls by Cecily Pinn. I will say before I get into the description of it, this was on the long list for the Women's Prize. Uh, I'll have my reaction to the winner. Of, I'll, I'll do my reaction to the long list because that's where you'll find this uh, for the Women's Prize down below. It immediately jumped out to me as something that I would like to read from that. And then when it did not make the short list, a lot of people who had read this as part of the long list were really upset. And the way everybody talked about it made me even more interested to read it. So I went out and got myself a copy and that's why it's here. Here's what they say. Based on her own mother's story and interweaving real historical events with fiction, Cecily Penn's debut novel begins in 1978, three years after the last U.S. troops have left Vietnam. Young orphan siblings An, Tan, and Min flee their village, first to Hong Kong, making their way as refugees toward the uninviting landscape of Thatcher's Britain. Their journey is accompanied by the voice of their younger brother, Dao, a lost soul who speaks from the hinterland between the dead and the living. Wandering souls... Is, a, is subtle and gripping, writes the LA Times, while the I newspaper says, this is a powerful and timely debut about seeking asylum, about what life is when it is ripped from its origins, and how happiness and identity can be found again on foreign shores. I've heard a lot of really good things about this book. I have heard that it's a little bit emotionally devastating. I am bracing for that. But it is something that I'm really looking forward to reading. This is actually one of the books that I'm hoping to catch up to in July. And I would definitely, I think, read this before I would get to some of one of the new discoveries on this list for me. But uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to reading this book, hopefully in July. So I'm happy to see it here on this list. Now we have another book that I just had not heard of at all. So it's going to be interesting to read the description of it here. It's The Garnet Girls by Georgina Moore. Let's see what it's about. 
Set on the UK's Isle of Wight, in, the, in a beloved but crumbling family home, Sand Cove, three very different sisters and their unconventional mother tackle life and long-held family secrets. The Sunday Times best-selling debut novel by Georgina Moore explores whether or not children can ever truly be free of the mistakes their parents make. Each of the main characters is flawed yet relatable, says the Independent, and the family dynamics between the strong women are portrayed perfectly by Moore. An impressive novel which leaves the reader feeling they have become part of their family. It's a confident debut, according to The Observer. With Moore's evocative prose, it's easy to see why The Garnet Girls is being likened to works by Penny Vincenzi. Well, I've never read Penny Vincenzi before, but that, that also sounds really interesting. And again, I wouldn't necessarily jump it ahead of the queue for what I have lined up for July, but I, and I don't know if this is released in the U.S. That, maybe that's why I haven't heard of it up to this point, but it does sound really interesting. I, and I, if you follow along, you know me. You know I love complicated family stories. I love sort of generational trauma stories and things like that. So the idea of exploring whether or not children can ever truly be free of the mistakes their parents make that is like catnip for me. So no matter what the rest of the description after that was was going to be, I, I was bound to be interested. This is another one I'll probably look at some other reviews for. Um, and again, I don't know if it's released in the United States, but I, I am potentially going to be thinking about it for the second half of 2023. And if you have read it, let me know what you thought in the comment section down below as well. Now we get to Old Babes in the Wood by Margaret Atwood. This 15-strong short story collection is Atwood's first publication since The Testaments. Divided into three parts, it is dedicated in part to Atwood's partner, Graham Gibson, who died in 2019. Scenes from the marriage of Tig and Nell Sandwich, a disparate bunch of tales that encompass everything from aliens to pandemics. Old Babes in the Wood is a gripping read, writes the FT, which highlights themes that are always at the heart of Atwood's work, the haunting presence of traumatic histories, profound imbalances of power and opportunity in the world today, and society's darkest possible futures. The Guardian says there are chips and fragments of lives full of sass and sadness. I actually, I think, do have access to this book on audio. I haven't gotten to it yet. That does really pique my interest. The only Margaret Atwood book I've read at this point, actually, no, there are two. I lied, I, or I almost lied. I've read, of course, The Handmaid's Tale. And I have read The Blind Assassin, which is her book. That, I was going to say her book that won the Booker Prize, but she actually has two. She co-won uh, a Booker Prize for The Testaments. And uh, I always forget that because I, in my head, I did the opposite of what people were worried was going to happen. I think of that as Bernard Dean Evaristo's Booker Prize. And I forget that Margaret Atwood was in there. People were concerned that Margaret Atwood, as the more known and established author, was going to crowd out Bernardine Evaristo. But in my head, it's Bernardine Evaristo's Booker, and the truth is they, they both got it. Uh, anyway, that does kind of pique my interest. Maybe I will prioritize this for the next half of 2023, because I think it's just been sitting in my audiobook queue, and uh, things keep bumping ahead of it. So maybe this uh, has maybe inspired me to prioritize it a little bit more. Now we get to Old God's Time by Sebastian Barry. When he's faced with the past he would prefer to forget, retired policeman Tom's life is thrown into further confusion. In the Irish author's ninth novel, Barry explores how the effects of violence and abuse reverberate across generations. Got that reverberating across generations? My brain is already tingling. Old God's Time is a reckoning with violated innocence, says the Irish Independent. The familiar story of the crimes of church and state is told in a fresh and spectacular way. Meanwhile, iNews describes the book as a profound state of Ireland novel. Barry, it says, is a master storyteller, exploring the fluid border between the real and the unreal and its relation to trauma. I've heard of Sebastian Barry. I've never read one of his books. And... That actually, again, you know, my brain started tingling the second it talked about violence and abuse reverberating across generations, but that does sound really interesting. I'm a little unfamiliar with Sebastian Barry's work. I, I know I've heard of him. I'm completely blanking on anything he's written that's previously maybe sparked my interest. So if you're familiar with him, let me know in the comment section down below. If you've read this book, let me know. I had not heard of this book. And it sounds really interesting. So again, I don't know if this has been released in the United States. And I, you know, I because I didn't want to read the descriptions in advance, I didn't double check to see what is or is not available here. Because the, the reality is also, 
if I live in the United States, and I do, and if I want a copy of this book, I can order it and have it shipped to me. Like you know, the way the world is structured now, I, I don't have to wait for it to be available in the United States. And that is you know, a, a nice thing. Uh, so regardless of whether or not it has been released here, I could purchase a copy for myself. Uh, the question is whether or not I would. So this does sound really interesting. Um, again, I don't think it's going to jump my queue for July, but it does really spark my interest. So uh, again, if you have feedback on it, let me know down below. And that takes us to the other book that I have a copy of right here. I actually purchased it once it was on Time Magazine's Best Books of 2023 so far, because it had already been on my list uh, of things to read, and that just really convinced me to get myself a copy. It's This Other Eden by Paul Harding. Paul Harding is a Pulitzer Prize winner for Tinkers. One of, probably actually, the most surprising Pulitzer Prize victory of my lifetime because no one had ever, ever even really heard of Tinkers when it won. So just fun little fact for you. The New York Times had not even reviewed Tinkers when it won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Like that's how small of a presence it had on the liter literary scene. Anyway, here's what they say. This is New Englander Harding's third novel following Enon, 2013, and his 2009 debut Tinkers for which he won the Pulitzer Prize. Enon, I believe, is something of a sequel to Tinkers, but I need to read Tinkers before I get to it. It is in this other Eden, though, that Harding's gifts have found their fullest expression, writes the Observer, praising the depth of Harding's sentences, their breathless, angelic light. Inspired by historical events, the story is set on Apple Island in early 20th century Maine, which the mixed-race Honey family have called home for generations, until they are abruptly cast off the island. This other Eden, writes the New York Times, is a novel that is both devastating and meditative. I feel like this is a case where I'm doing a Pulitzer Prize project where I'm reading every book that has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And this is one that I would read before I would read his Pulitzer book, for sure. I am really looking forward to this book. A couple of people who follow along on my channel have uh, read this since I first mentioned it in my most anticipated books of 2023, and they have loved it. The feedback is generally that the story is really good, a little bit heavy, but good, and that the writing is beautiful, and that just has me really excited for this book. So I am hoping to read this one in July as well. This is another one alongside Wandering Souls that I am really hoping to get to in July once I'm done with my Pride Month reading. And I, I have high expectations at this point for it. So it's really nice to see it pop up on this list as well as the Time Magazine one. And I cannot wait to read This Other Eden by Paul Harding. That takes us to the final book on this list. It's Romantic Comedy by Curtis Sittenfield. I've never read a Curtis Sittenfield book, but there there have been a lot of ones that sounded a little bit interesting. Also a little bit like I was really uncertain about them, but let's get to the blurb. In this humorous take on Hollywood rom-coms, Sally Mills is a comedy TV script writer who finds herself in an unlikely relationship that skewers all her assumptions about romance. Curtis Sittenfield is the author of the hit novels American Wife and Rodham. The author, says The Guardian, isn't above giving readers what they want, and that's exactly what she does in this affable, intelligently crafted tale of work and love. Throughout, the novel's command of structure, pace, and dialogue is faultless. The Washington Post points to Sittenfield's quick-paced prose and praises how vividly she depicts everyday life at the TV station where her protagonist works. The work becomes terrifically exciting and reminds us how rarely we get to see what people actually do at the office. I've heard that her work can be really insightful and that it can be it can sort of skewer uh, a lot of conceptions and forms and things like that. I think American Wife is probably the closest I have come to reading one of her books, but I think that one... I won't get into why, but like I also had some really big hesitations. Uh, Rodham, kind of same thing. It's always interesting when you kind of base a book off of a real life person, which is American Wife and Rodham both have in common, and especially political figures. So this is probably the one that I would read if I were going to read a Curtis Sittenfield book. I just... Not, I keep calling her Curtis Sittenfield, but it's Sittenfeld. I apologize. <laughs> but I'm just really not sure. So if you have feedback about this book, please let me know in the co comment section down below. Maybe I just need to get over myself. And if that's the case, let me know down below. 
I just am very hesitant of things that are sort of ripped from the headlines, and that's where a lot of her books have gone. Not necessarily this one, but, you know, that has always been my hesitation. For better or for worse, it is what it is. Anyway, that is the list for BBC Culture's top 12 books of 2023 so far. I'd love to hear what you think maybe should have been on this list and missed. Uh, or anything like that. If you have feedback about any of these books or recommendations based on the way I've responded to them, let me know in the comment section down below. As always, I really appreciate your time, and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.